Hello once again, everybody. Next up, we've got Matthew Phillips with his talk, Props Down, <coughs> Events Up, A Guide to Managing State. So something I'm very interested in, so I'm looking forward to this one. So over to you, Matt, I'll get out of the way. All right, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, this talk is all about properties and events. Properties, events, attributes, any type of way that there is to pass data within web components. Um, we'll go over a few topics here. We'll start talking about what state is and why state is important within your application and within your components. Then we'll, we'll talk about the different types of state management solutions that are out there, because uh, there's many different ways to manage state within an app that you might be interested in. Um, then we'll talk about properties and events and manage your state with component and what that means and what the advantages are to doing that and why you should do that. Um, throughout this talk, I'll reference back to native elements and talk about like how native elements work and uh, what they do and kind of comparing what you might be doing to what native elements are 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 known to do. Uh, anytime that you're you're unsure, like oh, should I should I should this be an event? Kind of look over to what native elements do, and that provides a real great guidance for how to make things that you know anyone that uses the web will be able to use. A uh, little bit about me. Uh, my name is Matthew Phillips. I live in Kentucky, USA. That's me. Um, some social things: Twitter at Matthew CP. Please follow me. Please, please, please. Um, my GitHub is Matthew P. I work for a company called Batovi. We're a small web. Uh, consulting shop. We do front end stuff, JavaScript. Uh, we do the CanJS uh, library. So if you've ever heard of that, we work on that. I'm currently working on some web component stuff there. So definitely check that out. Hire us if you want to make some awesome applications. Um, I'm also the, um, um, the, I have my own web component library. This is a personal project called Bram. Uh, it was quoted as being the, the best web component library uh, by, by me. Um, okay. So uh, Bram is a uh, is a very small layer on top of of native elements. Um, there was a talk just a, a few talks ago about writing native el writing um, uh, plain vanilla JavaScript components, and Bram is is very much in in that spirit. It just provides a very small layer on top of the native APIs, makes it so that you can do some things that are kind of difficult to do yourself. Okay. All right, so state. Uh, I think it, it's pretty much, I feel like it's almost required anytime you do a, a talk that has some type of term that's important that you have to define it with a dictionary definition. So I went ahead and did that. Um, the dictionary defines state as the condition of matter with respect, re, with respect to structure, form, constitution, phase, or the like. Uh, and what that means is, um, actually I'm not quite sure what that means in the strictest, in the strictest dictionary definition but if you're you know if you're a developer you I think you're already everyone's already familiar with what state is and you know what state represents all the different pieces of your application it, what its current form represents and it's it's state right it's it's very hard to define terms especially this term without using uh, without using the term in your definition but yeah state is is a hugely important part of what we do as web developers uh, so yeah, here's a great example of an application that is just chock full of state. Uh, this is Slack. If you ever used Slack before, I think you're familiar with with the, the interface here. Um, there's a state all over the place. Like just right off the top of the bat, there's a list of messages, and that represents some current state of of this of this uh, particular uh, channel. So anytime a new message happens, the state updates. A, a new message gets pushed into the end of end of that list of messages. And then you see the rest of the, uh, you see all the messages and you can scroll it and there's there's all types of interactions going on here. Um, I've highlighted a few like of the special types of state going on here. Uh, these are not strictly like, these are fake terms that I just made up, uh, but I think they, they represent the type of state that we have. Uh, first of which that I wanna highlight is this page state. Um, so we have on the left hand side, we have the list of channels and the tools channel, this is Polymer Slack, the tools channel is highlighted in green. Um, that's because that's the current channel that you're viewing. So we represent state by showing the current channel in green. Uh, in the same time, we have the URL, which also uh, shows the current channel as part of it. Uh, so I, I think that's important to remember is that 
the your state does not just represent in the UI that gets created, but it represents in other things, such as the, the URL is a big, big part of that. Then we also have over here to the right, we have a message and um, my mouse is hovering over that message. So this is a special type of, of hover state that's specific to uh, to the element to I, like I had no idea how slack is actually written but I can imagine that there's some type of component e kind of library going on here and so there's probably maybe there's a message component and the message component has some type of hover state that it that it, it is able to trigger and the hover state then shows a special little action bar here to where you can like uh, you can add emojis or you can uh, comment on it or reply to a particular message so that's another kind of state a very important state over here to the left is session state. So any type of application where you log into has a session associated with it. This is a thing that represents the user in his current like usage of the application. So in this case, this is my, my handle here. It's shown in two different places. Um, I think if you were to look closely at this application, you might, you might see other things that are like session related to me. Um, like for example, we see, let's see, uh, there's a little star under tools, and this, is, this, this provides a way that I could favorite this particular channel. That would be specific to me as a user. Um, so yeah, session state is a huge part of, of any application where you log in. The last one I'll highlight is, you know, this is arguably part of the session as well, but there's this where it says persistent. Um, there's this little, like looks like a birthday present icon. If you use Slack before, you might have seen this before, but what happens is if you click on that icon, it opens up a sidebar, which has like a list of new features. So it's a way that the application will let you know about all the cool new features that they've added since the last time you visited. This is persistent because if I refresh the page, it's going to show me that again. And it's going to show me that until I click on it and I take action against it. Um, so you can imagine this might be stored in a cookie or it could be stored as part of the session or local storage or something like that. Um, just another keep in mind, like you can store state in different different ways. Um, that's just one way to do it. Okay, so yeah, highlighted a few types of state here. We have application state. So application state is state that, rep that is representative of your entire application. This is the current state of your app as it exists now. Um, some of these things will disappear if you refresh the page because there's no reason to keep that thing, those things uh, uh, memoized. Um, then there's like component level state. So a component, you know, we, we, we like we write web components. They have their own state internal to them. Um, that state may or may not be part of the application state. In some cases it will be. And we'll talk about one particular state management solution where you keep everything in the application state, even component level stuff. And there's some advantages and disadvantages of doing that. Um, but keep in mind that that exists. Then there's a the session state, which again, this is like, this is usually part of your application state. So this is anything relevant to a particular user. Okay, yeah, I always wanna keep in mind that it's important to like, kind of when you're, when you're creating an application or you're creating a component or whatever it is that you're doing, keep state in mind at the very beginning. State is kind of the start of the process. Um, well, maybe not the very start of the process. You might start with mocking up your app uh, or doing, you know, maybe even doing like a little prototype. But once you've gotten that far, it's a good time to kind of take a step back and be like, okay, these are the components of my app, and these these are where the different parts of state is, because that's going to drive your development process and tell you where you need to store your state at any particular location. Um, keep important to keep in mind that the UI itself is can be seen as like a type of serialization of your application state. Um, so if you have some application state and you were to somehow save that and then restore it later, it should be able to redraw the same UI that you currently see uh, for the most part, because there's always that component state that's specific to that. Uh, but for the most part, the U, you can think of the UI as a way as a serialization form of your application state. And the same goes for the URL. The URL is literally take your state, serialize it. Now, the URL doesn't usually contain every piece of your application state, like your, your session is usually not part of that because that's stored in a cookie. Um, but it does oftentimes, and it can when you don't have sessions, is it can oftentimes uh, be all of the state. And then thirdly, part of your state is then serialized with the server. Um, so it's 
important thing to always consider is that state is the center of your application. But this diagram kind of it shows that what, I, what I'm talking about in the previous slide to where state is at the center. Uh, we're able to take a state and we're able to um, create the URL. We're able to draw the UI. Um, we might sync the state with the cloud servers as that state is modified. Um, I didn't show it here, but you can definitely imagine this is a list of to-dos that there's probably a form to add a new to-do to the list. And in that case, there would be an arrow going back from the UI to the state. Just reiterating once again that state is the, the center of your application. All right, now that we've talked enough, now, now, now that we know the importance of state, let's take a look at some of the state patterns that exist in the wild. Uh, this was a fun slide to create because I came, I came across all of these different state patterns that I never, never heard of before. Um, the interceptor pattern is a fun one. Uh, I, I actually, I kind of understood that one. Uh, there's the naked objects. I, I, I recommend looking that one up. It's, it's kind of fun too. Uh, but the ones I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about now are the MVVM pattern and the flux pattern because these are the two patterns that have become popular in the web world. Um, all these all these different patterns have existed for uh, several decades now. Anytime you're you're working on UI, I'm sure from the very beginning that UI started to be work on with computers, people were trying to come up with different patterns for managing the state of their application. Uh, but currently, maybe things will change. Uh, MVVM and Flux are the two most popular that that I've come across. All right, first let's talk a little bit about observables. So I'm kind of using observables and MVVM interchangeably. Um, I mean, observable, in this case, there, there's, there's, there's other types of observables. I think tomorrow there's a talk about using RxJS with web components. And RxJS is, is a really cool piece of technology. Um, I highly recommend watching that one tomorrow. I know, I know I will be. But the observable pattern is a little bit different in this case. View models are not those type of observables. In this case, they're, they're kind of, view models are, are objects that contain uh, observable properties. So in this small example here, we have a view model with a first name and a last name property. Um, and then it has a full name property, which is derived from those two. Um, how that works is that the first name and the last name property are both observable. So anytime any of either of those changes, the full, full name property will automatically update. Um, that leads to some very cool patterns where you can have view models that depend on other view models. So you can kind of see how this thing kind of grows. Um, you have, you know, other view models which depend on the full name property, and they're able to uh, update themselves based on on this like very long dependency tree. Um, so yeah, there's some there's some definite advantages to using this pattern. So the benefits are. Uh, all the computed, all these computed properties make it very easy to define their own dependency. Uh, the way these usually work is you define a function, and that function uses other observable properties. And anytime those observable, proper, observable properties change, that compute is recomputed. So it makes it very easy to, to to write a very small thing that just defines its own dependencies. It doesn't have to worry about listening to events or anything like that. Uh, this makes it very easy to connect disparate parts of an application. Um, it, remember, the Slack example had session throughout that application. If we were to model that application using observables, using MVVM, it would be very easy to, to be able to have like a concept of like a user object, a user model. And any time we like, say we change the username, um, all those connected UI pieces would just automatically change. You wouldn't have to do any any sort of like manual changing uh, of that UI. Uh, there's some pitfalls to using observables though. It's, there's definitely, it's, it's falling a little bit out of favor in the last few years. I think a little bit unfairly, but there's some legitimate complaints here. Um, observables can cause very deep event chains. Um, and this is something that I was talking a little bit about before is that you can have properties that can computed and what can happen is that um, some property deep down in the chain or maybe up in the chain is a better way to describe it changes and you don't really know where the source of that change is um, well just not knowing is is definitely a problem that's a that makes it very difficult to debug is that you know something changed you don't know why it changed and maybe you didn't want it to change 
um, that can be like a de definite source of frustration. Um, but it can also have some performance downfalls uh, if taken to like kind of an extreme degree. But I think those those complaints are usually um, they're usually kind of overstated in my opinion. Another another pitfall is that if you if you're able to give control if you're able to hand control over to your view models to other components, those components are able to cause changes to the parent com component. Uh, so this is something that you know, most people don't actually want, right? Is you want to be able to have a component that has children, and you don't want that ch that child component to ever be able to make changes to the parent component. Uh, but if you use if you use uh, view models in the way they're intended, that's definitely a possibility. Uh, but on the, on the flip side, doing that does make it very easy to like connect different pieces of the UI. So there's a lot of trust involved with using observables, I would say. All right, the second pattern that I'm gonna talk about is the flux, flux pattern. Um, this is often called the unidirectional pattern. This is a, somewhat of a recent pattern, um, or at least it's recent to my knowledge, maybe, probably in reality, it probably dates back for many years. Uh, but it's, it's become very popular in the last few years in relation to React and all those different um, virtual DOM libraries. It works very well in that particular context. So with unidirectional pattern, you have state as kind of your central source of, source of truth. Um, I talked about before that in some, some, in some patterns, you have state, uh, your application state is all of your state. Everything gets put in the application state. Um, you don't have to do that with, with Flux, but it's definitely a common thing to do, especially with, with Redux. Uh, Redux is kind of the most popular Flux library out there right now. I believe there's ways to hook it up to Polymer and other web component libraries. Um, so with Flux, you have state and that gets turned into view, right? Is that you take some state, you apply a bunch of different functions to it, and those functions derive uh, a view. And that, that's, what's get that's what gets written to the DOM. Uh, next step is that those those view components they do listen to like DOM events and those sorts of things, or they or maybe they will fetch like external resources and they'll generate what they call actions based off of that. An action is just a, it's kind of a representation of an event that is uh, more more centric to the to the business to the to the application. Um, from there, those actions get filtered, and eventually they become the new state. So you have actions that eventually get uh, turned into new state. Uh, Redux introduces the idea of reducers. Reducers are they're just functions, a bunch of functions that get applied to actions. Um, so we can think about it that each particular reducer function knows its own like kind of small little part of the application. It's able to take an action and be like, okay, for this particular action, I'm going to produce this new piece of the state. Um, and in this way, once you run all these reducer functions, you're able to generate new state based off of that um, that's completely new to the application. Then the cycle repeats itself. State get turned, gets turned into views. We listen to events. Um, very nice thing about the unidirectional uh, flow is that it's very, it's kind of the anti-observable pattern is that it makes it very easy for you to follow the flow of state throughout your application. Um, downside is that it forces you to couple things to some degree. Um, these reducer functions are kind of like global functions that operate on your entire application. Um, but definitely for for many cases, those reducer functions, they're only, they only know about some very small thing within your app, uh, but they're kind of applied on a global basis, if that makes sense. Um, so in that, that way, there's a little bit of coupling that happens when you use this pattern. Maybe there's ways to, uh, to get rid of that coupling. I, I haven't come across those, though. All right, so there's those patterns, and the pattern I'm going to be focused on for the rest of the talk is properties and events. Not just properties, properties and attributes. Uh, I want to give a big shout-out to attributes because attributes are not, are, not, um, um, are not given enough love because they're really great. and I'm going to tell you why they're great. Uh, with the properties and events model is that you have components. You have a parent component, child component. Uh, maybe I should use the term elements because we're really making custom elements. Um, but yeah, parent parent element, child element, 
The parent element passes data down to the child element through properties and attributes. And in, in the, child, uh, the child component then will inform the parent of any changes to its state using events. Uh, so this way, this is actually, if you'll notice, this is very much like the, the unidirectional data flow model. Um, the only difference is there's not this layer of capturing everything into uh, one central store. Now, you could actually do that with, with properties and events. Uh, it's just not necessarily necessary most of the time. Okay, so let's talk about being a good web component citizen. Now that we know all the different ways that we could uh, model our application, model our state, um, we, want, we, we, we wanna really be able to build APIs that others can very easily understand. And to do that, I think it is best to use the properties and, and events model. Because no matter no matter who you're working with, what team you're working with, you could work with an Angular team, but those those people probably have some knowledge of using the DOM to some degree, um, even if they started out their careers going straight to Angular. Um, there's always some 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 amount of, of DOM knowledge that you need to have. Um, so it's really the only universal way to to reach other people. That's what that's what we all love about web components, right? Is we love the fact that we can easily share these things with other people. So yeah, it's really talking about two different categories here. There's kind of the shared components. These are the things that you're gonna share with the world. Maybe you'll share these on webcomponents.org or maybe you'll share these uh, just within your company. If you work for a large company that has many teams, maybe some of them use React, maybe some of them uh, use Polymer. Sharing those as web components and using properties and events means everyone will know how to use those. Um, then you also have your project level components. And these are things that are like very specific to your application, like a shopping cart. These are never gonna get re re reused outside of your app. Uh, for those, you like go wild, like use whatever pattern works best for your team. Um, but when you're, work when you're working on these shared components, and this is what I'm gonna concentrate on, uh, properties, events, attributes are the way to go. So yeah, do as the web does. Um, we can constantly look back to the web and see what it does, and that will give us hints on how we should model our components. And what the web does is it allows you to configure them through attributes and properties, just as I've said. Uh, it will inform parent elements of changes through events. Okay, so let's run over a few examples of native elements and, and see how they manage their state. So the image element, um, yeah, learning from native elements. The image element, I really like the image element because it's a little bit like a web component. There's a image constructor and you can call new against it. Um, kind of a fun fact, when I was doing research for this talk, I was trying to find out, is, are, there any, are there any elements other than image that allow you to instantiate them uh, with new? And there actually are, are at least a couple that I've found that I didn't know about. Uh, the audio element allows you to do that and so does the, the option element. So it's a little fun fact there. Okay, so the image element lets you define a source attribute or property and then it also dispatches load and error events. So that looks like this. We have, uh, we can create a new image using new image. Then we can attach event listeners to that image. We attach a load and an error and event. And then we set, we set the, the image that we want to load using the source attribute. So image that source, I'm going to add the Bram logo to that. Uh, what's cool about this, what's cool about the image element is that it automatically starts downloading that image as soon as you as soon as you set the source. It doesn't wait for you to insert the image into the DOM. It doesn't. There's no method to call. As soon as you set the source, it starts doing it. Uh, that's cool because we could actually implement that ourselves. That's what's really awesome about web components is they allow us to do what the DOM does itself. We can do the exact same stuff. Um, so yeah, with 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 web components, we have getter setters now. Um, so we could easily have we could have easily created our own image. Um, maybe we write the canvas or something like that, but we, we could create this ourselves with web components. Uh, the way to do this is we have a getter setter pair. We have a private-ish underscore source property. Whenever you set that source property, whenever you call the, the source setter, it's going to set that underscore source property. And just the same way I said that the image, pro the, the image uh, element automatically step, starts downloading your image, um, our custom element is as well. So it's going to call this underscore fetch and underscore fetch is going to call the global fetch. If it works, hey, we're going to we're going to we're going to create a new load event. If it fails for some reason, we're going to create an error event, and then we're going to dispatch whatever happens. So you get the exact same API. Um, not that much code, right? Very easy to do. 
that's what's really awesome about web components. Okay, so another example is the progress element. Uh, the progress element is another super, super awesome native element. So the progress has a value attribute, and it also has a value property. Uh, so it's an interesting, interesting thing to note is that here we have a case where there's an attribute and property pair. There's both of them. So this is how you're able to set the value in HTML. The progress, the, the max for, for progress is one. So saying that 0.5 gives you, uh, shows progress as being about 50%. And then you can also set that with JavaScript. So we can get our, get our progress element and then we can change its value um, with JavaScript through the property setter to 0.3. Cool, right? Okay, progress also has a max attribute and a max property. Ah, look, same thing, right? We get, we're getting the same, the same type of thing. Attribute property pair, that's so cool. Um, so yeah, HTML, you can set the max to, uh, you can set the max to 100. So now this is showing like 20% progress, right? And then we can set the max with, 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 uh, with JavaScript as well, with, with, by using the property setter. All right, so how can we do this ourselves? How can we do this, do this in a web component? It's actually not that easy. Uh, it, well, I mean, it, I'd say it's easy. It's just very, very verbose. Um, so yeah, this is this is what it looks like. I actually have to scroll to show it all to you. Um, I'm not gonna show it. I'm gonna break it down into pieces so we can actually understand. Uh, first, we have the observed attributes. So this is a static getter on our element and it defines which attributes we wanna observe. Uh, we, we do this. Uh, so it makes it so that whenever progress.set attribute is called, that we'll be notified that the value changed. Uh, I think for performance reason, they did it this way, not just any, any attribute that gets set, you actually have to define which attributes do you wanna know about. So that will call the attribute change callback. Uh, so what, 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 what is that? Okay, so now we have the attribute change callback. Uh, the attribute change callback is a, is a callback, like all the other ones we have with custom elements. And it will call your setter, or excuse me, let me, let me circle back. The attribute change callback is gonna get called anytime set attribute is changed uh, for any of those observed attributes. Uh, in this case, we're just gonna call this, and we're gonna we'll call the setter with whatever the attribute changed is, and we're gonna provide it the new value. So this is gonna call our setter. So if we have a, we, in our, we, our custom progress bar here, we have a max setter. Okay, so what, what do we wanna do with that? Uh, well, you want to do two things. You want to, again, I'm going to, I'm going to store this as an underscore max variable. And then I'm also going to call set attribute. Uh, so this way, if someone sets max using a property setter in JavaScript, the attribute changes as well. That's a lot going on there. That's pretty verbose. Um, yeah, so you need to use a library. So Bram makes this very easy. It makes it very easy to say, here are my observed attributes and here are my observed properties. And it will go ahead and like smash those together and give you all the, all the great stuff you want. Uh, oh yeah, lastly, I forgot to mention this. Uh, in your constructor, uh, remember if, if the elements are on the page, they already have an attribute. So let's go ahead and get the value, the, the, the initial value of those attributes. Whew, it's a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, very verbose. All right, some things to think about here. Uh, should setting the property set the attribute if the attribute doesn't, doesn't already exist? Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean that, let's say that we have some HTML so we have a progress element and we're going to set, there's, there is no max, as you can see, there's no max attribute and we're going to set max using the property setter. So is, is an attribute going to be added to this? What, what do you all think? It actually is. This, this was very surprising to me. Um, I, I, I don't have any evidence for this, but I feel like maybe this is not consistent throughout the web. Um, I, I, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But like in my, in my mind, I, I was expecting it not to create the attribute. I thought, well, if the attribute doesn't exist, the setter is just gonna just gonna set it using that. It's, it's not gonna update the UI. Uh, maybe there is, maybe there's not consistency here. Uh, I'm not really sure, but that's that a very fun fact when doing my research. Okay. So we have all these different parts, all these different little tools that we can use. Those tools are attributes, properties, events. Um, how do we know when we need to use what? Like what are the, I guess I guess you could say, what are the strengths and the weaknesses of, of each of these things? Okay, so first attributes. Um, 
huge love to attributes. Attributes are great. Attributes uh, provide, oh, excuse me. Yeah, so I have an accordion here. This is accordion custom element. We have a couple attributes. We have an orientation attribute. This allows, a, so an accordion, if you don't know, is a, it's a, it's a little widget that is made up of a, of a bunch of different panels. It's a little bit like tabs in a way, um, except that it, it expands and collapses so that only the open panel will be shown. Uh, otherwise, you just see kind of the titles and you, you can click on the title and it will, it will expand that thing. Uh, yeah, it's it actually very much like tabs. I hadn't thought about that until just now. Um, so yeah, we have the orientation um, attribute. Then we also have an open attribute. This is a Boolean attribute. So attributes are great for initial state. So remember that HTML is like the most common thing that we have on the web. So you want to be able to provide initial state to your component using attributes. Uh, it's great for any type of state that should be queryable. What I mean by this is anything you want to call uh, query selector on. It's very, uh, that attributes are great for that. You can't do that with properties, right? Because there are no CSS selectors for properties. There is a CSS selector for attributes. Uh, the same, 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 same reason for styles. So you might want to style a component based off of, of what attributes it has. Uh, it's also great for any state that can be represented as screens or booleans. All right, so here's an example of attribute styling. Again, always try to go back to native elements, see what, what it is that they do. Uh, native elements have a way to disable that element. So this, this element's disabled. You won't be able to edit it. Um, maybe you want, want to change the background color for this input when it's disabled to make it more apparent that, hey, you can't use this thing. So we can easily do that with CSS. So that's a great reason to use an attribute. Uh, Boolean attributes provide a way to, to toggle that behavior, right? Is a Boolean attribute, Boolean anything that can be turned on and off, like we saw with that, with the accordion example, is that the accordion can, or excuse me, the, the panel within the accordion um, can be open or closed. Being able to set an attribute provides a way uh, to define that within your HTML. So Boolean attributes, huge thumbs up. Attributes are important because they are native HTML. I keep, I keep coming back to this. Is, um, it's become, uh, well, I'll expand on this in a second. But yeah, attributes are the native thing that we have. They're the, the most common denominator. Uh, it's the only universal way that there is to, to use an element. So it's been, it, it can be a little bit easy to forget about attributes when using your framework because a lot of frameworks make it very easy to to bind to like properties and that kind of thing. And that's actually Bram does as well. Bram, one of Bram's great things is you can you can bind the properties within its templating. Um, so, but yeah, you always want to remember that attributes are the universal universal way to uh, define behavior uh, on an element. So always keep that in mind. Try to try, try to keep that. Uh, Try to try to use attributes so that you can use them no matter what team is trying to use them. Okay, moving on to properties. So yeah, properties are like attributes. You can think about it, but but properties, you know, they're 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 the they're on the JavaScript representation. They're on the JavaScript element of of that uh, web component. Um, properties make it possible to like pass in complex data. Um, so in this, in this example, I have a user form, and I'm going to pass it in a object, a user object with a name and a GitHub ID. Uh, this is kind of this is kind of uh, I'd say maybe a little bit unsure of whether you should actually do this because you know going back to to what I keep going back to is that look to what native elements do. Do any native elements allow you to pass in objects? As part of the API, I can't think of any of them that do objects or arrays. Um, maybe there are. Maybe I'm just not thinking very well, but I can't think of any. Uh, anyways, properties are great for the changes changes to state that happen after an element is inserted. Um, so we saw with our progress example is that we define a value up front, and then later we can change it with properties. So properties are great for that. They make it much easier to do that. Uh, even state that's not necessarily, um, that's not settable, that is state that you don't want your user to be able to change, you might still make that accessible via getters. Getters are just way to like expose kind of internal, they're, 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 they're somewhat like events and they allow you to expose the internal state 
of that element. They just don't, uh, they don't emit a notification like events do that something changed. Okay, so in this case, you yeah, have another example where we change state, always look back to what native elements do. Um, the native elements allow us with the input element, we can change the value with properties. It's very easy to do that. I'll talk a little bit about exposing methods on elements. Um, the audio element is an example of a native element that does allow you to uh, call a method on it. There, there aren't very many examples of this in the wild, or at least not too many that I could think of. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some like debate. Uh, I, I, there was a talk last year, I don't remember, I, I wish I could remember whose talk it was. Um, but this developer argued against using methods um, on, on components, um, saying that you should use you know, attributes and properties. Um, I, I understand the argument because you know you could have defined this audio element with, with getters and setters properties. Play could have been a Boolean, and you set play to true, and it starts playing. Um, I, I understand that, but at the same time, I think sometimes uh, we can go a little bit too far uh, to try to to try to follow best practices. Where I think it makes sense in this case is that hey, I want to play the I want to play the element, I want to play the audio. I should be able to call play method. So keep in mind, maybe it's something you don't use a lot, uh, but you might expose those in, in special situations. Okay, so state can be derived, right? Um, so think about the time element. The time element takes a date time attribute. Um, you set that attribute, and in your JavaScript, you get a date. No, actually, you don't. This doesn't work. Um, you would want this to work, I think, right? Is that if you define if you define your date time using your attribute, it'd be great to be able to get that date as a date object in JavaScript, and then be able to call all the, all the different methods that date has. But this doesn't work. Hey, we could we could create a my time ourselves that that does this. Um, it has a it has a date time setter, and if you if you pass it a value, it's going to create a new date and it's going to set that as a date property, and then it's going to update the date time attribute with like that raw string value. Great, great web components. Okay, attributes versus properties. How do we know like which one should we pick? How do we know like how do we make this decision? Should I use attributes or should I use a property? Uh, we've gone over the strengths and weaknesses, just to reiterate, reiterate those a little bit. Attributes provide initial state. Uh, properties allow you to change state once a, once a element has been created. Uh, now remember that, that you can create elements with JavaScript, of course, so that means that before the element is inserted into the page, you can manip manipulate it with properties if you create it yourself in JavaScript. Uh, but anything that's actually written into HTML, Attributes is the way to go for initial state. Attributes can be styled, and properties cannot. Like I said, there are no CSS selectors for properties, uh, at least not yet, sadly. Attributes can only be past data that as strings or booleans. There's no other way. Uh, there, you could like you can pass like numbers as a string, and then internally convert that into a number. Uh, that that's fine. You you can do that. But but like objects and arrays. Actually, I've seen de there are definitely cases where um, some libraries allow you to like pass an object as like a JSON object, uh, and that's that's fine too. But uh, remember, in that case, you're you're passing like you're passing a copy of the object, not not um, not a pointer to that object in memory. Yeah. Where in some cases, maybe you want that pointer. Uh, so yeah, properties allow you to pass objects and arrays, and then properties reveal internal state. So you're allowed to expose some of the internal stuff that you don't want the user to be able to set. You can't do that with attributes, right? There's no way to like expose an internal property as an attribute. Um, as far as I know, uh, the consumer of an a consumer of an element can set any attribute it wants to. You can't like bar it from setting some particular attribute. So properties are better in that regard. So yeah, you can think about properties as being like kind of a, a super set of attributes, except for the one case of styling. I actually should have pulled the circle out a little bit. So the attributes do have that one that one big advantage to them. Okay, I went over before with the progress. 
of how to do bidirectional attribute and property setup. Uh, this is another example of that using Boolean attributes. I was able to fit this one on my slide, but just barely. Uh, this gets very, very ugly. This is another case where you'll want to use libraries that make it much easier to do this kind of thing. All right, lastly, we're gonna talk about events. Events make it possible to uh, expose state that changes within your component. Uh, modal is a great example of like some type of like internal state. Um, modals are, are windows that pop up over over top the rest of your application. They make the rest of your application go like black. And maybe there's some way to close that with the close button or something like that. You want to then expose an event for when that occurs. So we have a close event on our modal. Uh, so events reflect changes to the element's internal state. Um, these are almost always user user initiated. I can maybe maybe it's wrong to say almost always, but it's often user initiated. Is that maybe an element has its own shadow DOM, and within that shadow DOM, oh shoot, I I, try, I was trying to go the entire talk without saying shadow DOM, um, and the reason for that is all this stuff is not really it doesn't matter about shadow DOM. Um, but anyways, yeah. So your component might have some shadow DOM. It has its own UI within that. Some UI some UI changes occur. You want to re-emit your own event. Okay, so you're able to include data within the event detail. So this is a very uh, weird component that emits a tick event every five seconds. It's called, it's called every five seconds. Um, and you're able to use a custom event and pass a detail attribute with whatever data you want. Anything that's relevant to the consumer. So yeah, events give us a way to reproject internal state that happens with an element. They allow you to hide whatever ugly implementation details are happening inside of there. Uh, another example of reprojecting internal events, um, you have some type of form, and you want to you want to pass a very nice event to whoever is using your component. We're going to pass a user change event uh, to them by dispatching an event, I should say. Okay, things things couple things to consider here. Uh, but bubbling is false by default, right? So remember that there's this second the second property to custom event and to event. Uh, these are options. Uh, bubbling is false by default. I assume it's for like uh, performance reasons. I'm not really sure. Um, so you maybe we want to use bubble true if it's some type of event that needs to bubble and people might want to listen to from higher up in the tree. Um, also consider that you might need to turn composed on. So if so, by default, events do not pass through their do not pass up through shadow boundaries. Uh, if you use compose true, it will bubble up. So you might want to do that. Okay, last thing on event. So another way to, to listen to events is using these on event listeners. Um, they're built into the browser. Like you can set an on click event and then it makes it much easier to like, just makes it easier for like test pages and demo pages and that kind of thing. Um, you can do the same thing with custom elements. The only thing is you don't get that for free. You have to implement that yourselves and that's kind of a pain. Um, on event things, they work with delegation. So like this input has a change event and you can set your on change on the parent div and you're gonna, you're gonna actually get that. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, all elements kind of inherit from the HTML element. And the HTML element has all of these on event listers, all these on event properties on them. Um, so that's why bubbling works. It will not work for your custom element. You do not get the bubbling. There's no on user change thing going on here, right? Uh, something to keep in mind. This is very ugly. I'm not gonna talk about it. It's so ugly, but uh, yeah, use a library again to make this much, much better to do this. All right, benefits is very convenient. There's some interoperability advantages to doing this. Um, the virtual DOM libraries really like these on events. They're thinking about making this the default way to, to do events on custom elements. Uh, they haven't done that yet though. A drawback, this is very, very, very ver verbose to implement. Use a library, Bram is often awesome for this. Use Bram. Uh, do not work with other elements and there's no bubbling. Okay, some final takeaways from this talk. There are many awesome state patterns out there, all kinds of great things to choose from, but you wanna be a good web component citizen when you're authoring components that other people are gonna use. You wanna use all the different methods that people are already familiar with using the DOM. Properties and attributes go down. Attributes are somewhat of a subset of properties, uh, but attributes are awesome. Events come back up, and I, the more events, the merrier. Uh, because they're bubble false by default, there's not a whole lot of reason not to, to use your events when you, when you have any type of UI change that the parent element might want to know about. Lastly, on event is there for convenience, but it, it's a huge hassle to implement, and 
Uh, not a whole lot of people are going to use them, so maybe you don't even want to use them. I don't know. It's up to you. All right, that's the end of my talk. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and thanks a lot for inviting me to this awesome web conference. I've been having a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, lastly, follow me on Twitter at MatthewCP. Thank you very much, Matthew. It was a really good talk. Lots of interesting content. I mean, you know, state management with our components is really quite hot right now. So it's good to see some you know, great information yeah. on that, um, especially you know, the difference between properties and attributes and things like that. I get a lot of questions around that area. So really good. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you again for coming along and talking to us. Thank you. And we'll be moving on to the next session shortly. So stay tuned. <laughs>